titled the message, The Great Plague of Unbelief. The Great Plague of Unbelief. Thus saith the Lord. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, that is Thomas, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the prints of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. It's an amazing, it's an amazing uh, text. And before we look into it, uh, let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to open it up to, uh, uh, to our hearts. Spirit of God, again, we look at your word and we ask you, Holy Spirit, to use that word uh, the preaching of it, Lord, to help us, to edify us, to convict us even, Lord, if that be the case. And if there, there's one here today who knows not Christ as Savior, Lord, may this, may this passage uh, be used to open their hearts to come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Open up all of our hearts and our ears, Lord. Help us to leave here with a blessing that we can use in our life or share with another. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Today, and for the last year or so, the world is focused on the COVID-19 plague. Yes, the COVID-19 plague is a very serious virus, but any virus you catch is serious, some more than others. I was looking uh, online, and, and I was amazed at the Spanish flu of 1918, how many millions it killed, the Hong Kong flu, how many millions they, they killed, how many times the bubonic plague has struck different parts of the world, and how many people that it has killed. The plague has always been with us. Viruses are very serious business. And that in actuality, though, plagues have been with us ever since the fall from grace in Eden. How do we know that's true? Because in Genesis 6, Every soul on this earth died except for eight people from the great plague of unbelief, of evil. And what's interesting to note is that people are more concerned about preserving their flesh than they are in preserving their soul. You know, you would think with all the COVID thing going around and all the, and all the other viruses going around, churches would be filled. You'd think that you'd have to have a cop out there to direct traffic to get them in. Why? Death's knocking on the door. Boom, boom, boom. But they're not. They're more concerned about their flesh and living than they are in their soul. Now, to be clear, we're all going to die at some point. When you were born, you were given a birth date and you were given a death date. You were given a geological place to live. You were given parents that you were going to be born to. You were given a color of your skin. You were given intellect. Everything you have was given to you. There isn't one thing that any of us ordered before we were born. It was all given to us. And one day, when, it, when God had ordains that time, Ecclesiastes 3.1 says there's a time to be born and a time to die. And when that time comes, we die. It may be unfortunate. It, may, it, may, it concerns me as to how it happens, but it's going to happen. To all of us and it's always happened but we're really not going to die in the sense of looking at a dead squirrel on the, in the middle of the road as we talked about in Bible study this morning instead death is nothing more than a transfer a transfer from this realm to the spiritual realm it's a transfer from the physical realm to the spiritual realm and there's only two transfer tickets available one goes to heaven and one goes to hell. Period. No third choice. And we all, we all will live forever. All of us will. The people we talked about in Bible study that passed away, they're still alive. They're just in a different, they've been transferred in a, to, to different places. We're all going to die. And the interesting thing is that world in general and the Christian church in particular don't seem to care too much about where they're going to go when they leave this earth. They don't seem to care too much. They say they do, but they really don't. And you know how crazy that is when you consider if you die of the great plague of unbelief, you'll spend eternity in the eternal lake of fire. Do you know how crazy it is not to be concerned 
about your eternal, about your eternal life. This is a brief life we have here. I've used the analogy of a caterpillar turning into a butterfly, and it's really true. So yes, we should be concerned about this virus. All viruses, not just the COVID, all viruses. But we should be more concerned about our eternal fate. And if you don't think that's true, Jesus gives us that advice in Matthew 16, 26. So he says, for what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? You could gain the whole world here, and if you die and you don't have, and you don't have Jesus Christ in your life, what good did it do you? Yeah, you lived in a fancy place, or you had fancy cars, or meals, you didn't have to worry about cash. Sure, that was all great, but it's going to end. And the next life doesn't end. And people don't think much about that, even in the midst of this COVID-19 thing. I remember when it first started, don't you? Don't you remember when it first started? Every church was full. People couldn't believe it. They were, they were putting them in with shoehorns. <laughs> there were just so many people who wanted to be in church. They wanted to know about God. But then what happened? People started living, not dying. And the ones that lived, well, they won't, it's okay. I'm okay. You're okay. No one goes to church anymore. And for the reason being that they care more about their flesh than they do about their eternal fate. And we should make no mistake about it. No mistake whatsoever, the great plague of unbelief has infected most of the modern church today. Most of the evangelical church today is infected with unbelief. Progressive liberalism, humanism, sensitive seeker churches, they've all spawned the great, uh, the great plague of unbelief. And we see it in the church today. And it's not a new plague. It's not like this is all of a sudden a new plague. It's not. Unbelief has been around. It goes back to the first church and the 12 disciples, doesn't it? Our text is approved for us. After Jesus died, the great plague, uh, plague of unbelief was spreading everywhere. It was everywhere after he died. Apostles were taken off, and even the apostle Thomas caught a major dose of it, didn't he? And even though Thomas sat at Christ's feet, and he walked with him for almost three years, he ate meals with them. He had conversations with God. He slept with God. He prayed with God. And he healed the sick and cast out demons in Jesus' name. Even though he did all of that. He did all those things. When Jesus died and was buried, he still caught the plague of unbelief. He didn't believe. In the, in the passages that our brother Tom read this morning, they didn't believe him. They came back and said, we've seen him. No, you didn't. He's dead. He's buried. He's dead. Unbelief. It's not a new thing. Thomas's, uh, Thomas's faith was rocked. He was disheartened, disillusioned, and he was disappointed. And now, the apostle wouldn't trust anything that he couldn't see or touch. You know what he was doing? He was reverting back to his natural physical senses to circ circumnavigate his life. He was going back to the flesh. These are all symptoms that come with the great plague of unbelief. Now, unlike the COVID plague that takes away your taste and smell, I know a lot of people that that's happened to, and I can tell you from personal experience of having it and never having it return for maybe two years, that it's a very unpleasant thing to lose two of your five senses. It's very unpleasant and it's very difficult. Um, but unlike COVID, the great uh, plague of unbelief weakens your faith, it weakens your joy, and it disrupts your peace. And then, with that happening, that's the first phase of it, it's sort of like when you start to feel snuff, uh, uh, sniffles or a sore throat with COVID. And then after that, the flesh kicks in and it torments you for having faith to begin with. What did you have faith in Christ for? He's dead now. He's buried. You spent all that time with him. And what, what good did it do you? Whatever was going through his mind, it was unbelief. 
And we know these are the side effects of the plague of unbelief. How do we know, how do we know that they are? Because they worked on Judas Iscariot. They were, and they almost worked on Peter. He denied him three times. And now the great plague of unbelief had affected Thomas. These are, these are disciples of Christ, apostles. Now, in looking within this plague, we see the destructive spiritual viruses that cause the trouble. There's two of them. In every, in every virus, there's little things inside of it that cause the problems. And in, and in uh, unbelief, it's doubt and fear. Doubt and fear. Proof of that is that no believer, not one believer, not anybody in the Bible, other than Christ, was immune from the spiritual virus. None of us, uh, none of them were. In Genesis 17:17, 17, 17, Abraham had a touch of the great plague of unbelief. Uh, the Bible says Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said, in his heart, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? That's unbelief. He didn't believe God would do it or could do it. And in Judges 6, 6 17, Gideon also had symptoms of, the, of unbelief. Then he said to him, if now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who will talk with me. He didn't believe him. Show me a sign. And he threw out the fleeces. In Matthew 11.3, even John the Baptist, his cousin, wasn't immune to unbelief. Matthew writes and said to him, concerning Jesus being the Lamb of God, are you the coming one or do we look for another? Here was a man who, was, who, would, who Jesus called Elijah, who, who, who was the forerunner of Christ. And he, ha and he had to ask if he, you were the one. And these were uncommon, but these were uncommon events in life. And what happened was after these men got over that plague of unbelief, they went on to live godly lives for Christ. And, but the difference between the modern church and the early church that I just spoke about is that unbelief is infecting in the modern church just a handful of people. Rather, most of the evangelical church today is infected today with the great plague of unbelief. Most of the church today is infected with unbelief. The evangelical church. Pulpits and pews today are populated by tares and heretics who actually teach, pe uh, preach, and promote unbelief. Right now, there are millions of people sitting in churches just like you are. And they're hearing an altogether different sermon. They're hearing a sermon about how your body is your body and you can do what you want and you be sure to vote for this and you be sure to vote for that. They're telling you that it's okay if you make mistakes and if you sin, just get over it and you'll be okay. There's no, there's no responsibility. There's no one telling them about sin being destructive. It's not, it's not being preached. If it was there wouldn't be any people there. Now, we have a lot of people out there sick, but even here, we've never reached capacity, and all we teach here is the truth. So that gives you some idea of how infected the church really is. And how do we know that they promote unbelief? I said that. We know it's true because any church... Any church or pastor that's not focused on the written word of God, if this is not your standard here, then you are teaching unbelief. It has to be this book and this book alone. Not my interpretation of the book, but the interpreted as in context to everything else. If you're not doing that, you're teaching unbelief. How do we know that's true? Jesus put it this way in Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? How can we say that we, want to, uh, that we want to please God, we want to obey God, we want to love God? How do we say we do that if we don't follow His commandments? As they're written, how do we do it? You can't. They teach unbelief. Now that's the bad news. Now there's some good news, and the good news is there is a spiritual antidote 
that we can use to heal ourselves from this spiritual plague. There's an antidote. The instructions on how to apply this antidote begins in verse 19. Look down at verse 19. It says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in their midst. And he, say, and he said unto them, Peace be unto you. Now here Jesus is appearing for the first time after his resurrection. And then if you look down in verses 21 through 23, he gives various instructions to his disciples. He blesses them in verse 21 and gives them the great commission to go out and preach the gospel. In 22, he breathed on them and gave them the Holy Ghost. And finally, in 23, the Lord gives his disciples the ministerial power to, in, uh, to interpret his word and believe it or not, to enact church discipline. And I'm here to tell you this morning, Jesus is still showing up at church meetings with his people. How do we know that's true? Because he says it, Matthew 18, 20. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. He's walking here. His spirit is in this church. Talking to each of our hearts. Taking this word and, and putting it in your minds and in your hearts. And every one of you will come away with something a little different from it. I can tell you that for sure that that's a fact. Because Jesus attends every worship service, every Bible study, and every, every, every fellowship we have. How do we know that's true? Anyone who comes to our meetings regularly can give you a testimony that the Spirit of Christ is here. They'll give this morning, perfect example. There's no way in the world that we could have learned what we learned. And I learned as much as everybody else did. No way we could have done that without the Holy Ghost being there. Now we're going to get down to verse 24. And here we read, Thomas, but Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. He wasn't there. For some reason, Didymus, or doubting Thomas as he came to be known, I don't like calling him that, he's my brother, I call him Thomas, he wasn't worth God's people when Jesus appeared. He wasn't there. Now there are a lot of people who have a problem with that. I used to have a problem with that. You know, when the, church, when the church doors were open, I had to be there. Why? Because I wanted to be there. Why? Because I knew Jesus was going to be there. What else? Because I could learn or grow or I could be a blessing to somebody else. That's what church is about. Thomas wasn't there. <laughs> he wasn't. I don't know where he was. Nobody knows where he was, but it was for sure wherever he was and whatever he was doing, it, didn't, it wasn't as beneficial to him as it would have been if he was in that meeting. So, by not being there, Thomas missed seeing the resurrected Christ for the first time. And not being there, Thomas didn't receive the comfort, the strength, and the other blessings that Jesus gave the disciples. And because he wasn't there, he didn't receive the gift of the Holy Spirit with the rest of his brethren. He wasn't given any of those blessings. None of them. So here we have the first step in getting rid of the great plague of unbelief. And that step is being with God's people every time they gather together. Now I know people, I've heard it, and I have to say this, I wasn't a pastor my whole life. I've been saved for a little over 25 years. I've been a pastor for 14 of them. Those other years, I can speak sitting in the pews, just like you. I was always in church. I told my family, Wednesday night, Sunday, knock them off. I'm not available. Unless you want to come to church. You want to come to church, I'd be more than happy to pick you up and we'll go. Those are, those are uh, blackout days. I'm, I do that. I've always done that because I figure this. If God gave me this cross and everything that represents, and he put that in my life, the least I can do is give him two hours or three hours a week. And nothing trumps that. Birthday parties never trump that. Going on vacation never trumped that, although I must admit when I went on vacation, I never went to church. I rested. I have, I have Christ in me. You don't get saved in a church. A church is here to make disciples. So I tell people, you're going on vacation. If you don't have a good Bible church to go to, take your Bible out wherever you are on vacation and enjoy God that way. 
You have to have you have to have that commitment to God. It's about a commitment. I want to ask everybody listening and people online. I want to ask you this one question: How much of a commitment did Jesus Christ make for you? I've had people say, "You know, I got to drive 20 miles to get to your church," and you know my response is to them: "You know how far it was." from the praetorium where they, took, where, where they tortured Christ and he had to carry the cross on his back. You know how far it was to Calvary? He carried it for you. And although it may not have been 20 miles, I'm sure he felt a lot worse than you do driving in your car up here. You have to have a commitment. That's what religion is about. It's about having a commitment to God. And it's not one of these feather commitments, oh, I'm committing myself till the, till the church is over, and then I'm going to go out and run everybody over that's in my way in the parking lot. That's not a commitment. That's a mockery. Loving God and understanding God means that you have a belief system in your heart. It means that you're a changed person. You're a new creature, the Bible calls, calls us. And as new creatures, we have a responsibility to that cross, to live for it. It was Paul who said, it's not I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me and was crucified for me. And that's the role, that's the example all of us should have. Church should be a priority. Why? Because eternal life is a priority. And we're all going to have one. It's just a question of even if we're in heaven, what kind of, what kind of life are we going to have there? I told the class this morning in Bible study. I don't want Jesus Christ to say, well done, good and faithful servant, like he did in the parable of the talents. All he has to do for me is see me up there and smile. And I'm good. Because I know that I've done what I was supposed to do. I'm committing myself to him every single day, so why wouldn't I not do it for a couple days a week? Thomas didn't do it. He had the plague of unbelief, just like it's in the church today. And what happened to Thomas, what happened to Thomas in that he wasn't where, 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 where with his uh, brethren when they gathered together will happen to you if you don't practice and focus on being with God's people whenever they assemble together. I don't care if you do it in your home. That's all part of it. This church is very good about that. We have a lot of uh, interpersonal relationships outside of church. It's wonderful. I've never been in a church like this where people really care about each other and we really care about God and we're willing to help each other out and do anything for each other. Why? Because we have a commitment to God. And if we have a commitment to God, we have to have a commitment to each other. Why? Because you're my brothers and sisters and I'm your brother. That's a commitment. And unbelief tries to undo that commitment. That's, that's the sin is undoing the, 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 the fellowship that you have with God, the commitment you have to God by not believing. And that's exactly what Thomas did. And he missed all the blessings, and that would happen to us. And if you want my proof first, it's our text. But he said unto them, that is Thomas, this is in verse, I think, 25, except I shall see in his hands the print of his nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. He's telling his, his brethren that. Other disciples, I don't believe you. You didn't see Jesus. He's dead. He's buried. Here's a guy that, that lived with him who knew he was God. How much unbelief do you think he had in his heart? How bad do you think he had the plague of unbelief? That's an unimaginable statement, considering that Thomas physically walked with God for almost three years. Here was a man, here was a, Thomas was a man who heard Jesus tell a synagogue official, he said in, in Luke 8.50, but when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, do not be afraid, only believe and she shall be made well. And Thomas heard the Lord tell a man whose son was possessed by demons that the disciples couldn't remove. You remember, he kept going in the fire, and the disciples couldn't remove it. And he said to the man, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, move from here to here, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Thomas was there. And Thomas heard the master tell the people and, uh, what the work of God was in John 6, 29. Jesus said, this is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he sent that you believe in him who, whom he sent. 
Jesus was sent by God. Thomas knew that. You know that. And even, and even after hearing all of that, Thomas still wouldn't believe that Jesus had resurrected from the dead just like he promised that he would. He promised that in John 2, 19. He told him, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. They knew what he meant because he told them. Many times he told them, the Son of Man must suffer. You see, beloved, that is the power that we're talking about in the great plague of unbelief. Don't think unbelief is just this little thing that, you know, well, I had a bad day. Don't think that. Unbelief is vicious. And it tears. It just tears at your soul. Now, that all being said, let me tell you how the Apostle Thomas was a very wise man. Here's how he was wise. First of all, <coughs> excuse me. First of all, when he was told that Christ had appeared to the church, Thomas didn't cry out, I will not believe unless I see his face. I want to see his face. He didn't say that. He didn't say, I refuse to believe unless I see the Lord's crown upon his head. If he's God, I want to see the crown on his head. He didn't do that either. He didn't ask to see the crown. And he didn't say that he must see him gird around the chest with a golden belt. He didn't say that either. What did he say? Beloved, our text says, except I shall see the hand, his hands, the print of the nails, and put my fingers into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. That's all he said. You see, the apostles' demand for proof was actually a cry for faith. He, he knew he had lost, his faith was down to zero, or fumes. He needed his, strength, uh, his faith strengthened. That's what the cry was about. Thomas wasn't looking for the God-man Jesus. He wasn't looking for him. No, he was looking for the wounds that the God-man suffered for him. That's what he was looking for. He was looking for the wounds of the Savior. Why? Because only in the wounds of Jesus Christ is salvation and eternal life. You and I would not be on our way to heaven had he not died. Had those wounds, those crucifixion wounds, not been there. Had the blood not been spilled. We'd still be in our sin and we'd be on our way to hell. He wants to see the prince in the nails of his hands. He wants to thrust his hand into the wound of his side. And only the blessed wounds of the Savior will strengthen his faith. Nothing else will do it. I don't want to see your face, your crown, or your, or your uh, 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 belt. I want to see your wounds. Because that's what your mission was about. Dying so that we would live. I want to see your wounds. That's what will cure the plague of unbelief. Only the wounds... When the plague of unbelief begins to rob you of your taste for joy and faith, when that happens, look to the wounds of Christ for healing and for strength. When the spiritual virus of doubt and fear begin to spiritually paralyze you and fill you up, look to the wounds of Jesus for comfort and relief. Beloved, these are antidotes needed for getting over the great plague of unbelief. The wounds of Jesus Christ are the only antidote. And the way we apply these antidotes to our unbelief is to look into the wounds of our Savior. I wonder how many of us have done that. I remember when uh, Gibson, Mel Gibson, made the song Passions of Christ and everybody was all, was all oh, teary-eyed, all broken up because Jesus suffered so bad. I reminded them, your, your, your salvation come, did not come from his suffering. Your salvation came from his death and resurrection. The suffering was just part of it. And I dare say, Jesus Christ suffered more growing up perfect, sinless, never sick, perfect in every way. And he had to grow up that way. I told the Bible study the reason why I am now attempting to obey the traffic laws in this state by stopping at every stop sign for three seconds and everything else that I'm doing is I'm trying to see how difficult it is to follow the law. And Jesus did it 
perfectly all of his life. He never sinned, ever. That's why only his wounds, what he suffered physically, emotionally, all of that, terrible, torture, terrible, but he had to die. That's what saved us, his death, his blood that was shed that we might have life ever after. The way we apply these antidotes is to look into the wounds. And what will you see? When you turn to the Lord, have you ever done that? Have you ever looked at a cross? The corpus isn't on it, but did you ever look at it? And did you ever say to yourself, well, downstairs, if you look downstairs, I have on the cross, I, I, uh, I put that cross up and I tooled it, if you will. And I left blood stains where the hands were and where the feet were, just a red stain to let us know that that's really what counted. The blood is what counted. But did you ever look into those wounds in a metaphorical way and look at them as the healing wounds for all of us? They were. As a matter of fact, 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Excuse me. I wonder how many of us do that. Look at the cross. I don't think of the cat and nine tails. I don't think of that. I don't think of the crown of thorns. I don't think of that. The thing I think about most when I look at the wounds of Christ is I think about him hanging there and it going black. And in that total blackness, all of my sins were loaded on his back. That's what I think of. And that brings, me, that brings me to reality that maybe what I'm thinking and I'm doing, I need to, I need to refocus. I need to, get, I need to get back in the center of his will. That's what the wounds of Christ do, is it gets you back in the center of, the, of God's will. And when you're in the center of his will, what ends up happening is unbelief is no longer there. It's just like the flu left. It's gone. And you're restored. And you know the most wonderful thing about that? is that it's such an offense to God to doubt Him after all He's done for you in your life. There's a one Christian sitting here or listening today online. There isn't one of you that can't give a testimony of things that God has done in your life since you've been saved that would have never happened had He not, done, had he not been in your life. Those things would have never happened. And yet you still, you still have unbelief. I won't say it's a, it's a lot, but we get plagues of it. We get seasons of it. And that's exactly what happened to Thomas. He had a severe case of the plague of unbelief. What will you see? The first thing you're going to see when you look at the wounds of Christ is you're going to see his love for you. You know, one of the things in our class we're learning on Sunday mornings is that you have to take the Bible personally. The Bible is not a, it's not a general book. You know, there's a general book out, I think it's called Chilton's Manual for Auto Repair, and it's got all the cars listed, all the years, all the parts, everything you need, tells you what you need to do it, and you go and do it, okay? That isn't what this book is. This book is an application book. It's something that you press into your life, and you press into other people's life. You just press it in. And how do you press it in? You remember your commitment to God. And you remember his commitment to you. That's the antidote. And the first thing you should remember about his commitment to you is that he loved you enough that yet while you were still a sinner, he died for you. The wounds on his side and the nail prints on his hands are an emblem of suffering that he did for you. I remind you, there was nothing in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ for him. He got nothing out of that except you. That's what he got. And that's a good way to look at it. Because then you look at yourself as, how am I as a child of God? How am I doing? For somebody who gave himself for me, you know, people got all excited about this uh, Saving Private Ryan. It was, I guess it was, if you like war movies, that sort of thing, it was okay. And at the very end, I think it was at the very end, uh, uh, Private Ryan said to his wife, did I live a good life? I thought to myself, if Christians would only do that every day, Jesus died just like all the, the man that he was looking at there. I guess it was, uh, it was the, the lieutenant. And, and he said, did I live a good life? Because he told him to live a good life. 
And Jesus died the same way. He died fighting for you. All of your sins were put on his back so that they wouldn't be put on your back. And, and, and could we ask him, could we say to him, because he's here, he can hear us, could we, do we say to him, Lord, am I living right for you? What can I do, Lord? What can I do to live better for you? And you know what? He'll answer that prayer. Whatever it is, he'll answer it. You may not like it, but he'll answer it. And if you ask it, just remember, if you ask it, he'll answer it. He really will. You'll see the token of his love. That's the first thing you're going to see. And then you're going to see his suffering and the nail prints. And how about the spear? All of these things have, have uh, metaphors to them. The spear that was thrust into his side. You know what that spear was for? The guys knew he was dead. But metaphorically speaking, that spear was thrust into his side to write your name on his heart. He died for you. And you need to take that very personally. He died for you. And he engraved on his hand. The Bible says, Psalmist tells us, that your name is engraved on God's hand. It's a metaphor, but it's a metaphor of endearment. It shows you how much you mean to God that he would do that. You look at Jesus dead, you look at him buried, you look at him res resurrect, uh, resurrected, and re then remember, when you look at him in those three categories, all of it, everything he did, he did for Sally, he did for Rebecca and Wendy, he did for each and every one of us. Then by faith, by faith, put your finger into the nail prints of the Savior's wounds. That is, by faith, think about those wounds and what they represent in your life. And you know what? Soon you'll, you'll soon feel the cleansing and the healing of your unbelief. You have to look at the wounds of the Savior. You have to meditate on them. You have to understand the power you have because of those wounds. You know, you have more power now as a born-again Christian than you can ever imagine, and you won't ever realize the full potential of it because you're never going to turn the key and exercise the full potential of it. But you have that power, and, and, and you have the ability to apply by faith Every one of the wounds that he took, every victory that Jesus took in this world, you have the, the power because you are in him and he is in you to apply it to your life. There's not one thing you can't overcome in this world because Jesus overcame the world and everything in it. Listen, the creator who made the heavens and earth was willing. He was willing to set aside his glory. He was willing to take on the flesh of humanity. He was willing to bear the ridicule, the torture of men and Satan. He was willing to endure the wrath of his Father and take all the sins of his people. And finally, he was willing to die in our place, though we wouldn't have to. For all these reasons and many more, the healing, cleansing power of his wounds are the only remedy that you can have for healing the great plague of unbelief. Now, if you're listening to this and you don't know Christ as your Savior, you live constantly in the, in the, uh, with the plague of unbelief. Constantly. There's no belief in your heart. You see, belief, believing in God is called faith, and faith is a gift. Biblical faith is a gift. The Bible says in Ephesians 2 you are saved by faith through grace and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God. Period. You don't have that gift. But if you're listening to this message and you feel God stirring your heart and you want that faith and you want to get rid of the, the fear and the doubt that's probably crowded into your life, if that's you and you want to do that, then you see me after the service. And I'll show you how you can repent of your sins. You can ask Jesus Christ to save you. And the Bible says, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you can have that wonderful peace that passes all understanding. You can, you can have all the, all the pleasures forevermore in your eternal realm. And even now, to get through this world, you'll have all the power you need to get through this world if you just get rid of that great plague of unbelief. And Jesus will do that for you.
if that's what you want to do, you see me, and I'll show you how. Now, for God's children, the elect, yes, COVID is here. Real as rain. I sometimes, and I don't say this in a kidding way, I say it because I don't quite understand everything about it, but it's as real as rain. The most dangerous plague and, uh, that any human being will face is not the COVID. The most dangerous plague any human being will face is the, is the plague of unbelief. But the good news is you'll never, you have a remedy for it and you will never, you'll never suffer loss because of it. And when we allow this great, pla this great plague into our lives, and by the way, that's how we get it. I don't know how you, you don't catch it from other people. You allow it to happen. When you are saved, you're given faith. When you read your Bible, your faith increases. When you go to Bible studies, you grow and you learn. Your faith gets even better. You look at it at a level like this, like a, a gas tank, okay? Empty, full. And the more, you, the more commitment you make to God, the fuller the tank stays. The less commitment you make to God, you're using up spiritual energy every day, and that, and that needle just keeps going towards empty, going towards empty. And finally, some people get to the point where they're on fumes, and God has to do something, and he'll take, if you're a child of God, he'll get you back up. Even if it hurts, he'll get you back up. But for you, you have all that you need to get through this world in a glorious way, and to, and to, and to show that all you have to do is every single time doubt and fear creep into your mind and those are the viruses you get them because you allow them in your in your spiritual tank you put them in you wave the white surrender flag oh I'm having a bad day and negative about this and I'm and terrible about that and this didn't work out right that is fear and doubts breeding grounds and they are the beginning they are the beginning of you getting the great spiritual plague. If you get rid of them, it's simple. You do it with this book, that cross, and the gift of faith that he has given to each and every one of you. You do that, and you won't have to worry about the great plague of unbelief. You still may have to worry about COVID, but compared to the great plague of unbelief, COVID is nothing. It's absolutely nothing. Go home. And do that. Remember, you have all the power you need to live a joyful life. Jesus said, I've come to give you my joy that your joy might be full. We need, I come to give you my peace. All of those things are yours. Go home and claim them this afternoon and every day hereafter. Let's pray. Father, as we, as we look at your word and, and, and Thomas... And Lord, forgive me for calling him Doubting Thomas. Although he was, you forgave him. I, I forgive him for sure. And I'm sure everybody forgives him for that. Because all of us here, Lord, are guilty of unbelief. Would you help us, Lord, to stay away from those two viruses, doubt and fear? They're evil twin sisters that, that cause us to become spiritually sick because it forms into unbelief. Help us, Lord. We know it's your will. And so we ask it with great faith, and we ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is in the blue hymnal. We'll stand and sing 714, hymn number 714, I Know Whom I Have Believed. 714. We'll sing a couple of verses of it. Verses 1 and 4.